Everybody ought to know. 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 Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. Now we will move on to the formal response from Mr. Sangmoy. Uh, first of all, we thank Dr. Crouch for accepting our request uh, to share his knowledge and experience with us through this webinar, which is a Zoom platform. It is indeed a very proud privilege for me to have to respond to your presentation on the topic, the Olivet Discourse of Jesus in Matthew 24, 25, the signs of the times Apollo treatise on the last day events. I am extremely glad about it. The article presented entails a topic that is the need of the R, which is very relevant. The paper attempts to present the text contextually. All the details of the context are both thought and is presented in a very easy to understand way. It is an eye-opening article full of insights, informs us particularly me of how putting the text in its, in its context can totally negate and nullify the presupposition understandings. Mm -hmm. The impact of the paper where it enlightened, influenced, encouraged us to putting the text in its context are as such. Number one, the case of rapture, the text which the contemporary preachers always associate with rapture, that is Matthew chapter 24, verse 40 and 41. Two are in the field, one is taken away. Two are grinding in the grind mill, and one is taken away. It's being looked at, and the article presentation helps us to understand that this is not the rapture of the church, as there is no mention of the church in this whole passage. And the church, by that time, was yet to be established. And number two, putting the text in context helps us understand with the kind of tribulation that Christians have faced in the world since the first century. The kind of tribulation Christians have faced throughout the century is sourced in Satan and in mankind. The tribulation discussed in Matthew 24 and Revelation 4 to 19 is not sourced in mankind, but in God as he pours up his wrath against evil. Thank you very much for helping us to understand uh, the text in its context. However, I do have some uh, comments that I would like to give uh, in relation to your paper. Uh, the article presented begins with a very relevant current contemporary issue in relation to end times, that is eschatology. But the paper concludes very differently towards Revelation 7 and Israel. The issue raised in the con introduction is completely neglected in the conclusion. That is the first uh, comment that I would like to give in relation to the paper. Secondly, I would like to give a suggestion or a kind of response to your paper uh, is that Matthew 24 and 25 is a part of eschatology in the Synoptic Gospel. Mark 13 and Luke 21 are the parallel passages to Matthew 24 and 25. If mention, compare, and contrast is made between the passages, it will add to the understanding of eschatology in a very much clearer way. That are uh, Those are my two suggestions that I would like to give in relation to the paper. The first question is, the context of the text is important as the paper as such. Yes. If the text, if the context of the text is important, how do this, we justify uh, Matthew 24 and 25 in relation to Revelation chapter 6, 7, and 20, and so on, where Revelation totally has a different context and different audience? How do Good. we relate? Great. This to Great passage? question. Great question. In order to answer that question, we have to understand uh, Daniel 9.27. Daniel 9.27 says that there will be a, a man that we generally know as an antichrist who will come and will make a covenant with Israel for seven years. That covenant gives them the privilege of building their temple, 
of offering all of their sacrifices and of being protected by the Antichrist. For, but that only covers three and a half years because he changes his mind halfway through. So the Jews in Israel are protected from anything that will be against them for three and a half years. In essence, they are given protection so that they don't have, um, basically they have as little, re little reaction to the war that's around them as is humanly possible. Uh, they are protected from attack from without. They are protected by the Antichrist. And so in Matthew 24, he begins by listing what's going on in the tribulation period. The whole of the tribulation is listed in a matter of a few verses. But then, then he jumps from there, that summary, to the middle of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation. The first half of the tribulation period, the Jews are protected by the Antichrist and all of his authority and all of his power. At the middle of the tribulation period, he moves into the temple and he takes away that protection. So that at the beginning of the, the middle of the tribulation period, God calls or Matthew calls the great tribulation because it is on Israel a terrible persecution such as they've never had before and will never have again. That intensity is from man. Right now, if, if, the, if it were to happen today, we could see that they would be, as, as Zechariah uh, tells us, two-thirds of those in that southern part of Israel are going to, be, are going to die. Two-thirds of the Jews in that area are going to die. It's only a remnant that, the, that is going to be protected by God. So if we look at what's going on in the world around them, even today, and it'll be worse in the days to come, uh, Lebanon, Syria, uh, well, Israel is circled by Islamic nations. And those with war and, and hatred for Israel are seen in Lebanon, uh, Syria, uh, and the third branch coming up from, from the south in Yemen. Now, why is that important? Because we have a tendency to look at this passage and say, well, the Great Tribulation is described only as the second half of the 70 weeks. So the rapture must take place at the middle of the Tribulation period. No. Rapture doesn't have anything to do with this passage, as we saw from, from verses 40 and 41. What's happened is Israel is, is protected in the first half, but the second half, they're no longer protected, and they're going to be, well, they're almost, they're almost going to be driven, they're going to be driven out, and they're almost all going to die, except for the ones who are protected. Now, we have to remember that there, it's not just they're not just Jews and peoples of Israel in Israel. They're all over the world. And according to Revelation chapter 7 and 8, he's going to call 12,000 from every tribe all over the world as his ambassadors, his evangelists during the tribulation period. And the second half of chapter 7 shows the tremendous, tremendous response by those who come to faith in him, the great cloud of those who come to faith. Not Jews, but peoples of the world all over the world. Uh, does that help with the first question? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, let's continue with the second question. Good. The second Good. question is in relation to the end times, uh, which uh, is talked about in your page number six, Matthew 24, 22, 25, the parable of the fig tree, as oh, an yes. additional sign of his second yes. coming. So the, you made a statement that when um, Israel begins to sow life and bear fruit, that generation will be the mark that the time is coming shortly. Yes. So yes. in the present yes. age, Israel is progressing and 
uh, prospering. Yes. So is this the end of uh, the sign of the end of times? And if it is so, what about Mark chapter 3, verse 13, verse 10, where it says that signs of the end time is when the gospel must be preached to all the nations. So Excellent. There's actually two questions there. In this question, the first is of the fig tree. The fig tree is used as an example of the fact that, that the generation who sees the signs uh, of, of the people of Israel not only coming back to the land, and the uh, fig tree represents, is, rich, represents the Jewish people. And we understand that the Jews are descendants of the line of Judah, right? So the rest of Israel, the rest of Israel is not coming back to the land. It's the people who came from Babylon, who were taken away into Babylon, who came back into land. And not only all, not all of them by a long shot. Uh, but the, but the uh, fig tree helps us understand the generation that is going to be. And that generation, something I left out of this, but is in my th dissertation, is that the third step in this business of the, um, of the fig tree. First of all, it's alive. So that corresponds to Ezekiel 37. They're back in the land. Secondly, uh, they're alive in terms, of, um, in terms of their growing spiritual relationship. That is, they're putting on fruit. Now, the putting on fruit does not simply mean that they are they're active in the world and that they're becoming they're they're contributing greatly to the the physical stuff of the world but that they're coming to faith in the messiah now <laughs> it's very interesting um i went to seminary with a fellow who is the head of with a gentleman who is the head of chosen people's ministries used to be called american board of missions to the jews it's now called chosen people's ministries as the Lord led him, he began to uh, take his, his, uh, his people and began to instruct them in using um, Isaiah 53, which the Jews do not look at, and reading that to Jewish people in Israel and asking them what that's about. And they said, well, it's about, it's about Jesus dying on the cross, but we don't... We're, it, we're, well, we've never heard this. Well, it's it's in Isaiah. It's part of the it's part of your scripture. You've never heard of it, and many are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that the end has come. That means that we're seeing the birth pangs, the the beginnings of things. Now, the second question had to do with Mark. Uh, and Mark's statement was that the gospel had to be proclaimed throughout the world, and then the end would come, right? What is the end? What's the end of the end in terms of the passage in Matthew? The end is the end of the Gentile rule, the beginning of the rule of the Lord Jesus. So when we talk about the end, we're talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus in power and great glory. Now, who's going to proclaim? the gospel during the tribulation period so that all of the peoples of the world will hear the gospel message? The answer is Revelation 7. 144,000 radical men from Israel, not married, never been married, never had a woman, and their whole drive, if you know anything about Jews who are driven, um, and my, our, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gupta and myself were part of a seminary that the head of the seminary was a Jewish man by the name of Charles L. Feinberg, Charles Lee Feinberg, driven man. Well, what the apostle Paul called himself, one born out of due time, he saw himself as a man in the tribulation period. So we're going to have 144,000 men like the apostle Paul running around this earth, proclaiming the message of God's grace. And when that's been done, at the end of the tribulation period, 
when that's all complete and the whole world has heard the message, the Lord's going to come back to rule. So it's not about, it, it, it's very much in accord with what's, what Matthew has to say. Now, the, the other, there, um, there was another dimension of that that I, being an old man, it just slipped me. So let's go on to the third question and I'll, uh, I'll see if I can remember the other one. Uh, the third question is related to the kingdom of heaven for the Jewish oh, yes. man in Matthew 25, yes. verse 1 to 20. Yes. So in, in answering the, uh, the Jewish man question about the kingdom of heaven, Jesus mm -hmm. used the example of Jesus reading purified the kingdom of yes. heaven. The participants, the listeners, the audience, everybody is the... Uh, everybody is a yes. Jew. So in this kind of kingdom, you have said that it will be a physical kingdom on earth. Yes. So okay. Where do we right. Christian, as a Gentile stand in this kingdom? Here's, here's the answer. First of all, there's two parts to that one. The first one is, where is the king today? Is he on this earth? No. He's in heaven. The kingdom is where the king is. Philippians chapter 3, verses 21, 20 and 21 tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we wait until he comes to change our, our humble bodies into glorious bodies. That's true of every believer of all the ages. He's going to do that for us. Okay. Now, the kingdom of heaven is not just made of, of uh, Jewish people. The, the instruction in Matthew 24 and 25 is only for Jewish people, and that has to do with the kingdom on earth. The kingdom in heaven, where the Lord Jesus is, the king, he's given all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28. Uh, that Those individuals who are there are individuals who already have trusted Christ and have already passed into heaven's glory. Jews, Gentiles, everybody who has, who has come to faith in Jesus Christ. When he comes in power and great glory, he's going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem, but he's going to rule the world. Now, in the meantime, in the meantime, the Jews want to know, when is this going to take place? And how are we going to know when we begin to see some of, the, some of the little signs that are leading toward that time? And the answer is, they're going to know by the description in 24. In the meantime, between now and the time that that takes place, what are the Jews supposed to be doing? 25. The kingdom's in heaven. If their faith is in Jesus Christ, their citizenship too is in heaven. If they don't trust him as Savior, they need to beware. On the earth now, the Jews in Israel need to beware. The time is coming. They're going to be facing the Lord Jesus. They're going to be facing terrible times. And many will die outside of faith in Jesus Christ and will spend an eternity separated from him in the place called the Lake of Fire and Brimstone. So Matthew 25 is a warning to the Jews who are alive now until the time when the, when the uh, kingdom comes. In Matthew 20, uh, 24, it also talks about the fact that he's going to call the elect from all corners of the earth to Jerusalem, to Israel. Well, who are the elect? The elect are not Christians who came to faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. The elect are the Jews, because the context is Jews. The Jewish people who live on the earth at the end of the tribulation period, Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, tells us that all of those Jews who are alive at the end of the tribulation period are going to have their hearts changed by God from stony hearts to live hearts. Spiritually, they're going to be alive to the Messiah. They're going to come to faith in him. He's going to be their God. Jesus is going to be their God. 
as well as the Father who they worshiped all these years. Jesus is going to be their God as well as their king, and he will be, and they will be his people. But in the meantime, the kingdom's in heaven. Why? Because the king is in heaven. But he's coming. The warning is in chapter 25, while the kingdom is in heaven, it's coming. And you saw the signs of it in 24, so beware. Be careful. Be prepared. Love the Lord now. So when he comes, uh, it's another matter. Does that help? Yes, sir. Thank you, oh, so much, good. sir. We still have one more question. My doubt is as follows. Eschatology has always been a belief. Hinduism and Buddhism believe in several births before reaching uh, heavenliness. Their belief looks logical since a human being born in a poor family in a bad environment are not in the same platform with others. Is there any explanation? Well, Buddhism, Buddhism is, is, has no foundation in biblical Christianity. Buddhism is founded in Hinduism. If you know anything about the, the, the history of Buddha, Buddha was influenced by Hinduism. And uh, Buddha is a philosophy rather than a religion per se. They then turned and began to worship um, Buddha, but, but uh, some worship Buddha and some don't worship Buddha. Some it's just a philosophy of life. But Buddhism does not give answers. The Bible gives answers. So uh, the, the reality of, of uh, pain and suffering and poverty and all of that is found in scripture, not in Buddhism. Thank you, doctor, for your generosity. Uh, let me first and foremost uh, uh, thank God for the inspiration that he gave uh, to the HBI body to start the new uh, era of webinar that is uh, according to the thematic presentation and uh, the first one being the discourses of Jesus. And uh, let me thank uh, the administration for having consented to this idea. And today we are beginning uh, this discourses of Jesus, which would go for another uh, 10 or 11 months. So this is a time for me to thank the administration wholeheartedly. Also, let me uh, thank Dr. Jean, um, whom I contacted two months back. And actually, his uh, uh, paper was to be presented uh, last month. Uh, but uh, because of certain um, um, reservations, that is, we had already taken some, uh, some professors. So we postponed to this month. Uh, and uh, I am happy this month, more than 50% uh, almost all have, especially all from HBI have uh, attended this. And um, we are indeed very proud and very happy that this uh, discourses of G uh, Jesus uh, has begun with a very, very remarkable paper uh, from uh, Dr. Jean Crouch. Uh, let me thank him uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, for his readiness to um, inaugurate this uh, uh, program with this with your paper and uh, also for the readiness uh, to clarify any doubt that would come for any of the participants uh, not only now but in future uh, and then also his readiness to share his intellectual wealth with uh, with us by sharing his uh, uh, doctoral thesis and so on so it's a time for me to uh, express my uh, deep and uh, uh, sincere gratitude to Dr. Uh, Jean Crouch. With regard to the presentation of the paper, I must say that this presentation was like a journey. Uh, it was uh, starting from, uh, from Jerusalem. Uh, uh, since I lived in Jerusalem for, uh, for one year, I know the topography very well. And then uh, Dr. Jean Crouch started with uh, uh, from the journey from the temple, passing through the Kidron Valley and climbing up the Mount of Olives. And then Jesus sitting just opposite to the temple and uh, in the Mount of Olives, uh, uh, predicting all these things. It was like a, it was a very, very uh, sensational 
and emotional uh, experience for me uh, since i lived there uh, it touched me very much uh, also uh, one approach which i like to very much uh, in your dr g is uh, the intertextual uh, references which you gave uh, you were able to uh, cross check the uh, uh, events and references by going to first samuel by going to the book of zechariah uh, by going to the book of revelation and you were able to uh, cross check and it was uh, really an enlightenment and this is the usual approach uh, in most of the western universities uh, which i cherished once again after a long time in your speech so this uh, intertextual uh, references and uh, consolidation uh, is uh, very much appreciated in you also um, the importance that you gave uh, for the matthean uh, olivet discourse because in Matt, in uh, mark you know uh, from 11th chapter till 13th chapter only we have the jerusalem uh, jerusalem experience of jesus whereas in matthew we have almost five chapters from 21 onwards till 25 and uh, the central part is the olivet discourse and uh, you have taken that and uh, explained to it very elaborately uh, often referring to the contextual contemporary experiences so i thank you very much for relating the biblical events also with the present events uh, that is also very uh, very touching and uh, very emotional and uh, uh, very sensational actually which you have done very tactfully i appreciate you for that then moreover I appreciate all the participants who have usually we see the number in the beginning 50, 55, 57, like that. By the time it gets over, it will come to 40, 45, like that. But this time I was continuously watching the number. It remained 55 till the end, 57 to 55. <laughs> it remained. That means the amount of concentration people had in your speech and then the amount of uh, 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 attention that you can you have uh, taken from our participants so that has uh, really i was just observing from the beginning and then that shows uh, that people are enraptured with your presentation uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation and um, at this time as uh, the person who is responsible for webinar um, we would also like to extend it to the participants uh, one more proposal uh, which came in our meetings uh, that if any participant is attending all the 10, 10 discourses uh, all which we are going to present in these following 10 months uh, all the 10 courses attended and at the end sit with us for a short uh, uh, dialogue or interview online and definitely HBI will honor their participation and honor their interaction by giving a certificate so that is uh, i would like to uh, and uh, if possible we would try to get the certificate uh, online signed by almost all the presenters so if possible that would be wonderful because to have a certificate signed by all the presenters uh, um, especially from the renowned persons who are presenting papers from the, at, at the international level uh, so that would be wonderful for our participation. It will be a sort of source of inspiration and encouragement. So I would like to let know all the participants, uh, if you continue to attend all the discourses, what we are going to present in the next 10 months, and if you are able to sit with us for a short uh, uh, dialogue and interaction, definitely we will honor your participation and we will honor your uh, interaction with a certificate from HBI. Uh, thank you. And uh, once again, I thank the administration for uh, allowing us uh, to start this new venture. And then I thank uh, Dr. Jean uh, for his presentation. I thank uh, uh, especially um, Mr. Paujik, um, Mr. Um, uh, uh, um, Kai, and then uh, the respondent. And then we also uh, thank uh, all the persons who are working for it. A special word of appreciation for the IT team, uh, which has made um, a very powerful presentation this time. And every time that is the case, but uh, this time we have uh, 
uh, the music was wonderful that placed us in a good mood and thanked the IT team wholeheartedly. And let us uh, conclude this uh, session with a word of uh, uh, um, praise and thanks to God and, uh, um, and a prayer to God so that we may have a pleasant evening today and we may have uh, the teachings, what we learned uh, to be filled with our hearts uh, all through our life. Thank you. Let us bow down to God in prayer. <clears throat> Wonderful God, our Father and our Mother, thank you for this precious time. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the inspiration that you have given us uh, through this webinar. Uh, thank you for the beautiful insights that you have given us. We thank you especially for uh, uh, the resource person, Dr. Jean Kraut. Um, also, we thank you for uh, the respondent, Sangmai. And we thank you for all the persons who have uh, worked heart and soul for the success of this presentation. Lord, uh, it is your spirit that has uh, inspired us. It is constantly inspiring us to walk in the ways of uh, you, the Son, as given in the word, in the word which is present in the Bible. Lord, we thank you for uh, this inspiration which you are constantly giving us through the spirit. We thank you for uh, the different uh, sources of enlightenment and in insights uh, that you are giving us uh, uh, quite often and especially uh, with which we are blessed today. Lord, we thank you for all the good things that you are doing to us, uh, that you are doing to HBI, uh, that you are doing to all the persons who are connected with HBI. Lord, at this time, we pray that your spirit and your knowledge uh, May guide us always that you fill um, Dr. Jean Krauts with wisdom so that he may be uh, a resourceful person for many more people, for many more nations. Lord, we also ask us, ask you to bless us that we may go with these insights and all those who come in contact with us, who get connected with us, may be filled with uh, the wisdom, may be filled with the spirit of your son. This prayer we ask you uh, in the name of uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. May the blessings of God be with us, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with us and with all our near and dear ones uh, now and forever. Amen.